Welcome to the History of European Theatre Podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 59, Everyman, Dutch Morality. Last time, we visited the Castle of Perseverance to see the devil and his attendant vices fight for the soul of mankind. It's a morality play where there is as much interest in the illustration of the staging of the play as in the content itself, and it's just one example of what was, in the later medieval and early Tudor period in England, perhaps the most popular form of theatrical entertainment. Countless morality plays have been lost to history, but a few titles, descriptions and fragments have been rescued to support the very small canon of surviving complete plays. Titles like All for Money, Impatient Poverty, Like, Will to Like and The Longer Thou Livest, The More Fool Thou Art give a good idea of the content and we assume the approach was the same as for The Castle of Perseverance and Everyman that being the use of allegory and personification of vices, virtues and other traits to bring home a moral religious message. Fragments that survive and the complete plays all show the same or very similar characters moving through a familiar tale of man's fall and redemption. I don't think I found any commentary that really praises the morality play as a genre and on the whole this is because they are repetitive in their message and when we look at the individual plays they are essentially unoriginal. We can only assume that for the illiterate masses, the very repetitive nature of the plays was at least part of what made them popular. Having said that, in his 1972 survey of the subject, Peter Hall was able to define some types that indicated variations within the genre. Some plays, like The Castle of Perseverance, cover the full scope of a man's life from birth to death. In these plays, which are the most common sort, the main character is guided solely by Christian precepts and has no features of individuality. The second group are estates plays, where characters from different social classes are judged by the way they relate to the other classes, and for the contribution they make to the state as a whole. A third type focuses on a particular virtue, by showing a character who strives to gain that virtue, and the benefit he receives from it. So plays that work on a slightly more individual level, but are still supposed to be representative of society as a whole. In this type of play, the virtue is always cast as a feminine role. The fourth play is a hybrid that brings historical or biblical characters together with allegorical figures. The complete play King John is an example of this type. And the fifth type is the youth play. These were probably plays that were acted by students or children and designed to give parents advice about the benefits of a strict upbringing for their children. I don't think any of these could be classed as what we would call an exciting evening in the theatre but they were popular in their time and presumably the contemporary audience found them entertaining to a significant degree. The morality play was not just an English phenomenon. There's a French play from 1426 apparently written by students who dramatised a sermon delivered by the Chancellor of the College of Navarre in Paris. In it, reason presides over the trial of the human senses, who were being held accountable for the resistance to temptation. Also from France, in 1431, is a play written by a diplomat attached to the court of Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, where allegorical characters take part in discussions held at the Council of Basel. Records from Rennes in Brittany suggest that in 1439, considerable public funds were spent on a production that featured characters called well-advised and ill-advised. This appears to have been a bit of a crossover from the cycle plays, in the way it used spectacular stage effects. A large wheel of fortune was the centrepiece of the set, and as the character well-advised dies, he was carried off to heaven by a chorus of flying angels. At 8,000 lines long and a cast of 60, this was a play of the same scale and ambition as the Castle of Perseverance. The lavishness of productions on the European continent is one of the aspects that divides them from the English theatrical scene. The English were perfectly capable of lavishness, as we've seen with the cycle plays and the Castle of Perseverance, but the indications are that in the later period and in the morality play, this fell away and a simpler staging was the order of the day. This is probably related to the advance and enforcement of Protestantism in England, with its emphasis on personal piety and reaction against the excesses of the Catholic Church at the time. This was not quite the same in continental Europe, where swathes of the continent, particularly in France and in the south, remained within the Catholic fold. 
In 1476, a valet to King Louis XII authored a play that's called for a veritable carnival of allegories. In the play, while the cynical and worldly character Mondaine engages in every sort of depravity and excess, his opposite number, Juste, leads a blameless life. Perhaps the most surprising detail about the play is that for all its apparent predictability, it was played over several days to large crowds. And this is not the only example of the type of play in Europe that managed to mix extravagance in its presentation with a message of restraint and piety. In about 1507 in Tours, the already well-known playwright Nicolas de Chesney presented The Condemnation of Banquet, where the characters profanity, supper and banquet symbolise a high-living lifestyle. Their excesses lead to a succession of ills being visited on them, including the personified gout, colic, dropsy and apoplexy. They're sent to trial where Galen, the Greek surgeon and Roman period philosopher born in 129 CE, and Hippocrates, the Greek physician who was working around 400 BCE, sit in judgment. Supper is sentenced to wear lead handcuffs to curtail his orgiastic eating habits, while Banquet is sentenced to death by hanging. His hangman is a character called Diet. Particularly noted in the play is the degree of humour involved, and it marks it out from other plays, and apparently caused quite a stir at the time. The descriptions of the food consumed and the preparations for the banquets are so detailed that the play has been used to study the eating habits and table manners of the time. The representation of these things is really thought to be quite accurate. Morality plays from the states that were to become Germany and other parts of Northern Europe are also evidenced, but it's to the Netherlands that we have to go for the best-known example of the genre. The English version of Everyman from about 1500 is most likely a translation and adaptation of a Dutch play first produced about five years earlier, but it's possible that they are both separately derived from an earlier common source. At the time, England and the Netherlands shared some common interests, so perhaps it's not surprising that this play travelled between them. Both were trading and maritime nations, finding their feet in the growing mercantile world, where seafaring skill was already becoming a defining factor in relations between nations. Both also had the beginning of a religious Protestant movement, and there was also much exchange of ideas along with the trade, as is, of course, often the way, and we've seen before. Some 500 years later, Everyman is still given regular productions and is widely read, and it's the only morality play that we can make that claim for. In a short prologue to the play, a messenger asks for the audience to pay attention to the moral of the play that is about to be presented which will demonstrate the fleeting nature of life. God appears, perhaps rising from his place on his scaffold, and laments the way man has lost sight of his commands and have become obsessed with lust and greed. There are no directions as to how God appears, but it seems reasonable to assume that scaffolds were used, as in the cycle plays, saints plays and other morality plays. God decrees that man is unworthy and decides that it's time to come to an accounting for accumulated sins. He calls for death to come to him and sends him to find every man so that his ledger for good and bad deeds can be reviewed. It is time for his reckoning, as God puts it. Death seeks out every man but finds him unwilling to die and unprepared for the reckoning. When every man pleads to be allowed more time to prepare, death refuses him but says that he will allow every man to gather companions to come to him on his journey, the pilgrimage, as he puts it, that they will undertake to the afterlife. His only condition is that these companions have to be prepared to commit to completing the journey with every man. Every man is very upset by this situation, but seeks out his friend Fellowship, believing he will give him comfort, company and good counsel. As they meet, Fellowship sees every man's distress and promises undying loyalty. But when every man tells him what is required, Fellowship realises that he too would die on this journey and refuses to help. As Fellowship leaves, every man determines to find his relatives, kindred and cousin, believing that ties of blood will be stronger than those of friendship, and they will make good companions for his journey. Despite their promise to stand by every man through wealth and woe, they are also afraid of death and take their leave from him quickly. Left alone on stage, every man is full of self-pity and wonders how his friends and family could have abandoned him so easily. Who, he wonders, can he turn to next? After some considerations, he settles for asking his long-term friend, Goods. 
in words that mirror those already heard from his other friends and relations, initially Goods promises to help, but immediately changes tune once every man explains the situation. As that news sinks in, Goods has more bad news for every man. She informs him that their friendship has been damaging every man's reckoning for years. Because every man loved Goods instead of loving God, judgment is weighted against him, and he will be consigned to hell. Every man is shocked, in despair, and feeling completely alone. But in this dark moment, he realises that good deeds could help him. He finds her, and she says that she is willing to help, but she is weak from the weight of his sin and neglect, so cannot stand. Although she is too weak to journey with him, she suggests that her sister Knowledge can help him balance his reckoning. Knowledge takes every man to confession, who says that his only hope is to repent. In my modernisation of the original English, he says, I know your sorrow well, every man. Because you have come to me with knowledge, I will comfort you, as well as I can, and a precious jewel I will give you, called penance, a wise friend in adversity, and in her presence you must chastise yourself, with abstinence and perseverance in God's service. Every man takes to prayer, begging God for mercy, and then takes a whip and inflicts pain upon himself as a means of gaining forgiveness. His actions revive good deeds and she is able to travel with him. Knowledge then presents every man with a garment of sorrow, which will make his true contrition obvious to any who see him. The sisters call for every man's friends to attend on him, discretion, strength, beauty and five wits, and all agree to join the company. Knowledge sends every man off to prepare for his journey by seeing a priest to receive the sacraments of Holy Communion and Unction, the last rites. While they wait for him to return, Five Wits makes a speech praising the superiority of priests. Knowledge reminds him that not all priests are good, but Five Wits says that nevertheless they should be honoured. Every man returns, now prepared for his journey. As he approaches death, every man feels weak and realises that it's time to face his reckoning. As he starts to climb into his grave, he asks Beauty, Strength, Discretion and Five Wits to join him. But they all take their leave and he realises that all earthly things are but vanity. Knowledge, however, agrees to stay with him until the moment of his death, and Good Deeds promises to argue his case strongly when he comes to God's judgement. As every man and Good Deeds pass into the afterlife, Knowledge, left alone on the stage, says that she hears angels singing, and is confident that Good Deeds will see every man safely into heaven. An angel appears and welcomes every man into heaven, saying that his reckoning is crystal clear. And then in a brief epilogue, a doctor comes on stage and tells the audience that they must make sure they make amends for their sins in their lifetime so that they are prepared for death. They can, he says, only rely on good deeds to save them from hell. From the very start, the messenger makes the message of the play very clear. Sin and death are explicitly linked. Adam and Eve are responsible for mortality, and an eternal life in heaven is possible through living a good life. Death is the event that gives the possibility of reviewing a life lived, with the central image of the reckoning being a ledger with good deeds and bad actions balanced in two lists. The inherent sinfulness of man is also pointed out in God's speech, and sets up the narrative of the play and every man as an allegorical figure. He also makes clear the opposition seen between a state of virtuousness and that of owning goods, worldly prosperity, as he puts it. This is another theme often repeated in the play, as the various worldly characters are shown to lead every man astray, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unwittingly. The fact that the arrival of death catches every man by surprise emphasises his sinful nature. Born out of an arrogance that assumes death will never arrive for oneself, and that no account of good or bad deeds will ever be taken. By recalling the story of Adam and Eve, death is stressing the universal and unavoidable sinfulness of men, and his reminder to every man that life is a gifted loan brings the theme of humility forward, reminding the audience that they should not take their lives for granted, as all men live under the power and whim of God. Every man himself is not intended to be a sympathetic character. He's selfish and fearful of what's expected of him for most of the play, so the fact that his various friends and relations behave in a similar way shouldn't be surprising. When he first turns to his friends in the form of the character Fellowship, we can perhaps forgive his surprise and their reaction and, as he would see it, their disloyalty. 
But when this pattern is repeated with the relatives and then his possessions, we've got the message and his self-pity makes him, well, unlikable. Of course, sympathy, characterization, and humanity aren't the point. These are purely allegorical characters delivering a message. That is their only purpose. But they do achieve a little more. So friends and relations cannot save you any more than goods or possessions can. One's time on earth would be better spent being concerned with spiritual matters. In fact, fellowship is not just shown as abandoning every man at the end, but as blocking his route to righteousness throughout his life by helping him in the pursuit of worldly goods. There is perhaps a touch of irony being used here, as initially every man believes fellowship can help him escape from his fate, not be one of the causes of it. The characters of kindred and cousin are even quicker to abandon every man than fellowship was, again the opposite of what might have been expected. Blood, it seems, is not thicker than water in this case. Goods is similarly unprepared for every man's request and particularly useless in the face of death. At the time, this was a topical debate. The church was making a lot of money out of the selling of indulgences, official papers that, on the authority of the Pope, absolved the purchaser from sins committed. Not only was this seen as very unfair by the poorer classes who couldn't afford such an easy route out of their sinful state, but many saw the system itself as corrupt and unbiblical. It was to become one of the fires that fuelled the Reformation in Northern Europe, and we are perhaps beginning to see the beginning of that unrest here. So every man's belief that goods can help him in his predicament is understandable in the circumstances. The realisation that goods has betrayed him is a turning point for every man, as he now sees that he should have loved God during his life to ensure salvation. Every man proves that a concern with materialism and vanity is not a 21st century phenomenon. In the end, Goods is quite cruel to every man, proving to be the most faithless friend and the main block for his salvation. Every man, and therefore all men, the play says, are dedicated to materialism and vanity and have forgotten the way to a virtuous life. And what really comes across here is the sense that every man has lost all sense of his own self-worth. With his life closely entwined with reliance on his friends and the need for possessions, once they are removed from him, or rather, once they have removed themselves from him, he has no way left to validate himself and is left bereft of his own self-worth. This is one of the sections of the play where the themes feel very modern, or at least timeless, and perhaps explain why the play is still revived today. The judgment against the need for possessions and the validation by others resonates strongly in the age of consumerism and social media, just as it apparently did at the time of writing. When every man realises the error of his ways, the turnaround is very quick. No psychological character development here to form a gradual realisation, but again, that isn't the intention. The message here is that, of course, anyone suddenly facing eternal damnation would repent their sins, but that in itself won't save their soul. It takes the selfless help of good deeds, who even in her weakened state stands out from the other characters in her immediate and steadfast offer of support for every man. Even then, she needs the help of her sister Knowledge, whose immediate suggestion is that every man should go and see confession. To the medieval audience, Knowledge probably implicitly meant knowledge of God and the Bible and the sacraments of the Catholic faith, rather than knowledge in general. Confession lives in the house of salvation, and it is from there that confession makes a plan for every man. The plan involves pain. The idea that physical pain, especially self-inflicted pain, could be a route to cleansing the soul was a mainstream theological idea at the time, so probably seemed much less shocking to the contemporary audience than it does for us today. However startling the self-flagellation may seem, it's only part of the route for every man to his salvation. He needs the sacraments too, but fundamentally he needs to recognise that he is not capable of saving his own soul before he can start his pilgrimage with any hope of a good outcome. After the meeting with confession and the self-inflicted physical pain, there is a chance. For the first time, we see him showing humility and humanity instead of arrogance and self-interest. There is still hope for him and salvation is now a possibility. The somewhat recovered good deeds is confident that he will be saved, implying that he's already done enough, but that goes against the final message of the play, that in the end it's only God's grace that can guarantee salvation. 
When every man is given the garment of sorrow to wear, knowledge implies that it pleases God to see his creations acting with humility and contrition. The play reflects the later medieval trend to take an extreme view of morality as a matter of denying all earthly pleasures. As everyone starts his journey, he is also joined by discretion, strength and beauty. These virtues are very much subordinate to good deeds, and at first glance seem like an odd addition. Prior to this, all the bodily virtues have been shown as fickle and transitory, so how does strength and beauty fit in here? Possibly the idea is that these two virtues can apply to the soul as well as to the body. But it's an ambiguous moment, and can be seen as going against the general ethic of the play, which is otherwise really stated quite clearly. The speech where Five Wits speaks on the supremacy of the clergy feels a bit out of place in the play. Perhaps it was added for some specific later reason and isn't original to the play. Its only direct use is to act as a time filler while every man is absent. The claim that priests are above the angels also seems extreme to us, but the idea that the authority of the church was second only to that of God was a common view at the time, and was the type of belief that would feed into the desire for reformation. Although that reformation didn't get properly started until maybe some 50 years after this play was first written, the English translation and later adaptations that are incorporated here may well have strengthened the message of individual responsibility and that particular passage of rhetoric that questions the probity of some priests. The conclusion is the unsatisfactory belief that even failing priests should be respected. The institution of the church is still, as yet, the only route for salvation. However, the passage remains an interesting insight into the tensions in Europe that were beginning to build long before the impact of the Reformation is usually recognised. As beauty, strength, discretion and five wits leave every man at the moment of death, the main thrust of the play is confirmed. In the end, death is a lonely business, and these virtues are just as transient as fellowship and goods were. Even discretion leaves, suggesting that human judgment is too flawed to be relied on when it comes to saving a soul. Ultimately, humility in the face of God's judgment is all that matters. As good deeds takes her leave from every man, she emphasises the moral message of the play, that all earthly pleasures and pursuits are as nothing in the face of death. But then an angel appears and declares that every man was a man of singular virtue and will therefore be taken into heaven. That seems to say that it's okay to live a carefree life, repent at the last minute, and then all will be well as far as saving the soul goes. That's not the moral message of the play when looked at in detail, so why the ambiguity? Well, perhaps it's a recognition that for most people, living an entirely virtuous life was an impossibility, and it acts as a message of hope for the gathered audience. In any event, and just in case anyone has missed the message, the final speech by the Doctor makes it clear that the story should act as a warning to all and that everyone should look to their conscience and spiritual life before death arrives, as it inevitably will. Although not present throughout the play in a speaking role, I wonder if death is often a silent presence on the stage, making his presence felt and racking up the tension for every man. The play is a form of dance macabre, a dance of death, which was a frequent artistic motif in itself that reached the height of its popularity in the later Middle Ages, specifically designed to be a memento mori, a reminder of the nearness of death. The form probably developed out of illustrations in published sermons. From the period when Every Man was written, paintings and frescoes showing popes, kings and citizens dancing with death in the form of animated skeletons were being added to churches and other buildings. Later, Hans Holbein would incorporate the motif into woodcuts used in printed books, which further popularised the idea. Death's powerful presence is played against Every Man's vulnerability as the play ends. What stands out most in the play is the simplicity which, at the end and in the face of death, gives the character of every man an ability that is lacking in the main protagonists in many other morality plays. The strength of every man as a play and a clue to its longevity in the theatre is the way the characters appear quite humanised despite their allegorical heart. They are very much more so than many characters in other morality plays, and even in some cycle plays, where the characters are supposed to be taken from life. That is achieved by each character relating to very human and real specific circumstances, and by each scene building on the previous one to reveal some degree of individual character in the virtues and vices, not just polemic. 
In this way, the journey that every man takes moves from abstract idea to concrete situation and speaks to the audience. In fact, every man isn't a typical morality play. It doesn't follow every man from his birth to seeing him face temptations to his death but it's only concerned with the very end of the story. All the choices have already been made and the summons received. It does, however, maintain the medieval fear of death and belief in the route to salvation. That's no surprise, given the nearness of death in everyday medieval life. Frequent and often unexpected is perhaps the best way to sum it up. But every man, like other morality plays, ends on a message of hope. Next time, we will jolly things up a bit and look at medieval farce. Could medieval man get away from this religious and moral torment and have a good time? Let's see if that's what farce really meant to them. In the meantime, please take a look at the website for the various medieval-related pictures that I've put up there. That's www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com and then follow the links to the gallery or the blog. If you would like to support the podcast, please post a rating or even a review on Apple Podcasts or go to patreon.com for more content for a small monthly fee. And of course, you can join us on Facebook on the Facebook group or follow the podcast on Twitter. Any contributions go towards offsetting the costs of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. We're getting towards the end of the medieval season, so if you have any questions stacked up about the period, please do get in touch and I'll do my best to answer them before we get to the close on this part of theatre history. And of course, generally, if you have any questions, comments or concerns, you can always contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 